Um, it gives me it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Chris Longenecker this morning. Chris comes to us from Case Western in Cleveland, Ohio, where he's a non-invasive cardiologist and medical director of the Research and Innovation Center at their Heart and Vascular Institute. Uh, we are so delighted to have recruited Chris to Seattle. He'll be joining us starting November 1st as our inaugural director of Global Cardiovascular Health a joint program between cardiology and global health. Chris's research, research program focuses on mechanisms of cardiovascular risk and prevention in HIV, both in Cleveland and in Sub-Saharan Africa. In Cleveland, he started a multidisciplinary HIV cardioembolic risk clinic. And when he joins us here in Seattle next month, he plans to launch a similar cardiology clinic embedded with uh, within Madison HIV Clinic at Harborview, and this will be uh, I think this will be a tremendous addition to uh, Harborview. Chris's work is funded by a number of NIH and foundation awards. He's co-PI of a U01 award on a nurse-led intervention to extend the HIV treatment cascade to cardiovascular disease and prevention. And he's co-investigator on several R01 awards largely focused on HIV in Africa. Uh, Chris will speak to, to us today about his work on CBD prevention for people living with HIV in the U.S. and Uganda. Uh, again, welcome, Chris. Uh, looking forward to your talk. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Nana. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, really looking forward to talking about HIV. Uh, last summer, I was able to talk a little bit about the rheumatic heart disease work that we've done over the last decade in Uganda. Uh, but today we'll be focused on, on HIV. Um, and as Nana said, I'm still uh, technically at UH and Case Western, uh, but really looking forward to launching this new program um, at uh, UW in uh, just a little over a month. So uh, here are my contacts uh, for now, uh, including my Twitter handle, uh, HIV Cardiodoc, and, uh, and my case address. So I have no disclosures. And this is the outline of what we'll be talking about today. So we'll, we'll start with some background because I know uh, probably the majority of the audience is cardiology and, and may not be as familiar with, with HIV, although I hope maybe a few ID fellows or ID faculty have been able to join in. Uh, then we'll talk about my two big projects uh, currently for which I'm um, uh, PI uh, in, in the US, uh, the extra CVD study and then uh, in Uganda, the Polesa Uganda trial. And we'll talk about um, how both of these uh, studies are related and innovations that are happening within one study may influence the other. And this concept of reciprocal innovation to improve cardiovascular disease care for people living with HIV. So let's start first uh, with some background. Uh, the UNAIDS estimates that about 38 million people are living with uh, HIV around the world in 2020. And as most of us know, the vast majority of this disease burden is uh, within Sub-Saharan Africa, um, as, as shown here. And um, this uh, obviously um, has, uh, has been changing over the last two decades in the sense that access to antiretroviral therapy has dramatically improved the situation on the ground in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, especially since I was a uh, medical student working in Swaziland in, in 2003, the access to antiretroviral therapy has, has really taken off. And so that UNAIDS estimates currently of the 38 million people living with HIV in 2020, 87% of them knew their status, knew their, that they were HIV infected, and 73% we're on antiretroviral therapy, which is now 27 million people. And uh, of those then, of the total population, 66% had achieved suppression of the HIV virus uh, in the blood. And so, um, you know, this has led uh, to Im greatly improved outcomes, primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the percentage change, as shown in this updated publication from GBD in 2019, uh, in, in ART coverage has really been greatest in Sub-Saharan Africa. So that's where we've seen such dramatic improvements uh, over the last 20 years. And this has obviously then led to major declines in overall mortality driven by declines in AIDS mortality. And that blue line here is, uh, is Sub-Saharan Africa. 
So obviously as AIDS mortality goes down, something else is going to take its place, right? And that's non-AIDS uh, comorbidities such as cardiovascular disease um, as shown here in our publication from the American Journal of Cardiology a few years ago, uh, this has only continued to, to increase. Um, and so we have uh, multiple phenomena leading to increased rates of cardiovascular disease. The proportional mortality is going up. The population is aging. But the question also is whether or not HIV is in itself a risk factor for heart disease. And a number of epidemiologic studies have looked at this question over the last uh, 20 years, uh, some of them shown here, um, and looking at the uh, relative risk or effect size for myocardial infarction or coronary heart disease in HIV versus non-HIV. And after adjusting for um, a, a number of potential confounders, uh, that relative risk seems to be between one and a half to twofold. Now, the problem here also is that uh, most of these studies have been conducted in the USA um, and Western Europe or Canada. And we do not know for sure really what the uh, risk is in Sub-Saharan Africa. Is the risk associated with HIV higher or lower? We don't, we don't know. Um, and obviously that has a lot of implication when you think of the global disease burden because the vast uh, majority of people living with HIV are in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this gets at the idea of population impact, right? So, you know, the, popu the population impact of HIV and CVD burden depends not only on the risk of HIV, but also on the prevalence, uh, as you know. So the two of these combine to determine the, the population impact. So if you have um, maybe a minor risk factor, but it's very highly prevalent, it can have a big population impact. And this uh, can be expressed in terms of a population attributable fraction uh, as shown here. And so uh, with Anoop Shah at uh, the University of Edinburgh, uh, we published this analysis of the global burden of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease due to HIV. And uh, using GBD data and a meta-analysis of, um, of the HIV uh, effect, we were able to, to estimate that in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, um, the population attributable risk of HIV for ASCVD is, is upwards of, of 10, 15%, um, especially in Southern Africa. And in the uh, supplement, you can uh, read all the different estimates for each country. And Uganda, where I work, falls somewhere in the middle of the pack here at around 5% uh, population attributable fraction. And this is you know, similar to other countries in East Africa, but not quite as high as countries in Southern Africa, uh, where HIV prevalence is higher. Uh, but certainly higher than countries uh, like Pakistan and Kazakhstan, where the, the cardiovascular disease burden is quite high, uh, but the HIV prevalence is low. So if we were able to tackle this uh, residual risk that we see in HIV, um, this could have huge impacts, uh, especially in, in places around the world, um, such as Uganda, where, where I work. Um, but but what, is that, uh, what is the cause of this residual risk? Uh, what are the drivers of this residual risk in, in people living with HIV? And I think, uh, you know, I've done a lot of work in this area, uh, as have others, um, and it's not going to be the focus of what we talk about today. Uh, but I think that uh, in 2020, um, the bulk of this residual risk is really uh, due to inflammation and immune activation, potentially some um, uh, residual confounding from traditional risk factors, uh, such as uh, smoking and, um, and hypertension, uh, high cholesterol, and the risk due to antiretroviral therapies and specific drugs themselves is actually really quite low in 2020. Um, many of you on the call may, may think of HIV and cardiovascular risk in HIV primarily in terms of the meds and protease inhibitors, and I think that was really the, the dominant paradigm uh, 10, 10, 15 years ago, uh, but those risks have uh, decreased substantially. But when you think about not just the residual risk, uh, but the overall risk um, that is uh, within the population of people living with HIV, it really is those traditional risk factors. And it's in this nice uh, publication from Carrie Althoff um, at Hopkins and the North American uh, 
its cohort collaboration, you can see that the top three uh, risk factors on a population level for myocardial infarction are really total cholesterol, hypertension, and smoking. And these are much more significant than HIV specific factors such as a low CD4 count or a high viral load. And this is in contrast to um, other analyses they've done for end stage renal disease or uh, liver disease for which these um, HIV specific factors have a little bit more weight on a population level. And uh, unfortunately though, despite uh, this increasing awareness of cardiovascular risk in HIV, um, Guideline-directed medical therapy is, is often prescribed, uh, uh, is less often prescribed for people living with HIV, and particularly in this analysis for statins uh, and aspirin. And so the, the question remains is how do we, how do we uh, bridge this gap and improve these disparities? And in our uh, 2019 uh, AHA statement on characteristics prevention and management of cardiovascular disease in people living with HIV, we explicitly uh, pointed this out and said there are many opportunities for implementation research aimed at leveraging this uh, vast HIV care infrastructure that we have uh, to deliver integrated cardiovascular prevention care and uh, listed a number of potential ideas, uh, some of which I'll talk about today, such as strengthening specialist referral pathways, um, nurse management, and uh, co-located clinics. So let's talk specifically about this US context and the extra CBD study. Again, the name for this is a nurse-led intervention to extend the HIV treatment cascade for cardiovascular disease prevention. I'd like to start with an exercise, which I think you'll find um, interesting and hopefully shift your mind, mindset a little bit on this. <clears throat> so let's say you have two uh, patients on your, on your panel, uh, two people living with HIV, one We'll say on the left side is Greg, uh, no, no reference to Greg Ra there, uh, 50 years old, um, has had uh, HIV in, uh, since uh, 20, uh, 2002 and has been on antiretroviral therapy ever since then. Uh, he was diagnosed with AIDS at the time of his diagnosis and had a very, very low CD4 count, um, but has reconstituted his immune system uh, with a CD4 count currently of about 600. Now this other guy, Bill, uh, is also 50, um, but he uh, has uh, been diagnosed more recently through, through HIV screening um, and has also been on antiretroviral therapy since then. So his Nader CD4 count or CD4 count at diagnosis was, uh, was much better and he currently has um, a CD4 count of 1,000. Of, uh, of course, they both smoke uh, like many of our patients do. Uh, but Greg over here has a blood pressure of 140 over 70 on amlodipine and an LDL of 100 on the Torvastat. Bill has a better blood pressure on no meds uh, with an LDL of 100 on the Torvastat. So if you were to look at these two patients, uh, I think many of us would recognize that Greg over here uh, on the left is at higher risk, um, primarily for these differences in traditional risk factors, but also because he had a lower Nader's TD4 count which may really lead to um, higher levels of residual uh, chronic inflammation and immune activation. But here's the kicker. Sam in the middle here is also 50, but he's HIV negative and he smokes of course, but because he's HIV negative and doesn't have any other chronic disease, he's not engaged in care and is walking around with a blood pressure of 150 over 90 and an LDL cholesterol of 160. So now I ask, you know, who's at higher risk now? I think it's probably Sam, right? This guy in the, in the middle. And so the point of this is that I think that our, our people, uh, patients uh, living with HIV um, are engaged in a care system that potentially can really help them if we, if we have the right systems in place. Um, because we can get them on proper treatment and, and prevention of cardiovascular events. So we believe it's time to extend the HIV treatment cascade for cardiovascular disease prevention. I described the HIV uh, treatment cascade globally uh, a little bit earlier, and this is the concept uh, for those who are less familiar, that in order to achieve optimal outcomes in HIV, you really need to be uh, diagnosed first, obviously, 
but then prescribed antiretroviral therapy and take that ART as prescribed in order to achieve suppression of the HIV virus in the blood. The reality is that many of our patients now uh, in 2020, especially in the United States, but also uh, globally in many parts of the world, have achieved this viral suppression. And for them, it's now important to turn our attention towards prevention of non-AIDS comorbidity, prevention of ASCVD by appropriately diagnosing, appropriately managing, and reaching blood pressure and cholesterol targets. But there are barriers. Uh, there are unique barriers to our patient population. And one of them is this concept of, of risk perception. And I hear this from patients a lot. Uh, they tell me, you know, I always thought I would die of AIDS, right? Many of them have lived through the, the darkest time of the HIV uh, epidemic. And, you know, they were smoking and, and thought, you know, it doesn't matter. I don't need to prevent cardiovascular disease. Um, I'm, I'm going to die of AIDS. And so, um, changing that risk perception is, is a challenge. And when we looked at this um, in terms of looking at perceived susceptibility to cardiovascular disease and other measures uh, here on the, on the x-axis um, against ASCVD risk scores calculated by the uh, pooled cohort equations, we really see there's not much of a correlation. And, uh, and so how do we address this, um, this uh, gap in perceived CVD risk? There are systemic issues uh, and healthcare system issues as well, right? Who does primary CVD prevention for people living with HIV? Uh, this was a very interesting study by Lance Okeke, our good friend from, from Duke uh, and, and colleague on this project, um, where he looked uh, at um, who provides prescription for uh, blood pressure drugs for hypertension on the left and statins for hyperlipidemia on the right. And you can see that there's really, it's a mixed bag. Uh, infectious disease does alone sometimes, primary care alone, um, both uh, together, um, other specialists, and then a large portion uh, not having any medications at all, uh, which is an issue. Um, and so maybe perhaps a little bit worse for statins uh, for hyperlipidemia. And so what, does, what, what is the result of this? They looked at um, in a longitudinal study that the uh, proportion of patients who achieved control of their blood pressure varied uh, according to who was prescribing the blood pressure drugs, right? So if ID was prescribing your blood pressure drugs, you actually had about a 16% lower chance of control um, than uh, if primary care uh, was the one prescribing your drugs. And it was worse uh, if there was uh, a situation where both were prescribing uh, at the same time. And so, uh, and, and this is even after uh, controlling for potential uh, confounders that they had in their data set uh, between the populations. So, um, you know, this is, this is uh, an interesting situation, but there are other considerations about this phenomenon, right? And, and, and it's that the people living with HIV really, really trust their HIV providers. And I think this is incredibly important. So this is a, a quote from uh, our qualitative study that we did uh, as part of the formative work for this uh, grant. Um, and I'll just read, I just have an HIV doctor. And he asked me the last time I was in if I had a primary care doctor. And I said, that's you. He said, no, it's not me. And I said, I just have HIV. Nothing else seems to be wrong with me. So you're my primary care doctor until such time I feel I should see one. And I think this is very illustrative of many of our patients. There are other even larger systemic issues that I think are unique uh, to the HIV space that we need to consider. And one of them is the financing of HIV care in the United States. This graphic describes uh, some of that, including the Ryan White Care Act. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, I'd point you to this publication uh, from BMC Public Health last year, in which we described some of the, the qualitative findings related to healthcare financing um, in, in, our, in our study. Uh, but I think that uh, having this extra funding uh, from Congress uh, to provide HIV care gives us an opportunity to, to um, use some of that uh, to prevent non-AIDS comorbidities. And in our clinic in Cleveland, we use some of the money um, to pay for a dietitian, for example. And we actually have a lot of resources available to us to, to support our patients in this journey. So let's talk about the extra CBD study. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Raj Vedanthan, who many of you know, uh, who is on our team and who has been on our team since the beginning. And the conception of this project 
Uh, and he works in East Africa and Kenya um, and has done a number of things uh, that worked their way into the extra CBD uh, grant, um, uh, including two big projects, the Big Pick and Strengths uh, projects uh, shown here, um, in which he's looked at um, you know, the role of task sharing, uh, having nurses play a more important role in, in blood pressure management in Kenya, um, and using human-centered design approaches to um, stakeholder engagement uh, to, to hone um, uh, implementation strategies. And so um, we're going to, you know, talk about this a lot, but, but this concept of reciprocal innovation, ideas honed um, in the United States, perhaps may have relevance to, to East Africa, and ideas honed in East Africa may have relevance to the United States. All right, so this is a collaborative effort. Um, clearly, it's a U01 grant, uh, which is a collaborative award with uh, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Um, and uh, we have three main academic hospitals involved, university hospitals in Cleveland, Metro Health, which is our, our county hospital in Cleveland, and Duke Health uh, in North Carolina. Um, as I mentioned, NYU case also involved. This is part of a larger NHLBI consortium of projects. Um, the, uh, those are shown here in this graphic from uh, publication in Progress in CBD. And if you're interested in learning more about the larger precluded consortium, uh, this um, issue uh, of Progress in CBD was was dedicated to uh, the Preclude Consortium and, and other cardiovascular disease prevention uh, papers uh, uh, in HIV. Uh, there is a, a Washington site. This is a VA project uh, looking at improving COPD care. So um, we, our grant is structured in such a way that we felt it was important to first assess the current context of care within our three academic medical centers uh, that I just mentioned. And so in a mixed methods uh, uh, formative assessment, uh, we, we looked at this and, and I'll show, share some of the qualitative data, um, which comes from focus groups and semi-structured interviews with 51 people living with HIV and 34 healthcare providers at these three um, academic medical centers. And the question really that we were interested in is what are the constraints on and opportunities for integrated cardiovascular disease prevention care for people living with HIV? So um, don't have time to go into all of it. Um, if you're interested, um, uh, Julie uh, Skeksnader is the first author um, in Implementation Science Communications, just published a few months ago. But I'll point out a few of the facilitators um, that I think are, are really important. Um, and, and I've mentioned this before, but access to resources. There really are some unique uh, opportunities to access resources uh, for our patients. Um, and this concept, uh, again, that I mentioned that HIV providers are really, really trusted uh, by their patients. Um, the issue of uh, self-monitoring, our patients are used to, you know, their numbers, knowing their numbers, you know, what is my CD4 count? What is my viral load? And so um, conditioning them to think about their um, non-HDL cholesterol or their blood pressure and, and, and getting them to monitor that, that's something they may uh, be more uh, apt to, to, to do. But there are significant barriers. And despite this um, you know, wealth of resources, and, and maybe I'm uh, over-exaggerating this wealth of resources, but um, there sometimes is a situation where you have all these different uh, people trying to see the same patient in clinic. You, know, you might have the cardiologist, and OBGYN, you have social work and mental health. And it, it can become difficult uh, creating bottlenecks um, and, and ultimately um, priorities need to be set. Um, but also, uh, you know, this concept of HIV provider messaging on CVD risk. Um, HIV providers are you know, rightly focused on HIV care uh, as are the patients, but perhaps uh, to the detriment of other uh, uh, co comorbid conditions. Another thing that came out is, is uh, related to med, uh, med adherence. And many of you may remember um, the 1990s when highly, an, highly active antiretroviral therapy, HART it was called, was really uh, a cocktail. And it was referred to as a cocktail because there were so many pills that you had to take in order to control your HIV infection. However, nowadays, we've really been able, able to reduce this to one pill once a day for many of our patients. And so, so this is remarkable. Uh, but what we found in some of the qualitative work is that our patients are taking their antiretroviral therapy religiously uh, 
but not necessarily their statin or their blood pressure meds. There's kind of selective adherence, uh, not true for all, all patients, but for a certain number of them. And there's a bit of this PTSD of the old days when they had to take so many pills and they want to just try to reduce their pill burden as much as possible, uh, like, like many of our patients do, like many of us want to do. But um, this is particularly true for certain, certain patients. And then finally, I'll, I'll mention that there, there is an influence perhaps of healthcare financing. And this came out in some of the interviews um, and, and uh, those clinicians on the call know what an RVU is. Uh, in some health systems, this is a, a metric that is really monitored closely to determine if someone is being productive or not. And if you Google RVU, uh, this is one of the first graphics you see, obviously focused on making, making money. And so um, some of the, the clinicians treating, treating uh, people living with HIV were saying, look, I, I'm here to treat HIV. I can't focus on other things. I'm not paid to do that. And I need to produce more RVUs uh, to make my division chief happy. So, um, you know, this, this I, I don't want to overstate it, but this may be playing a role in, in, in some of the reluctance to address CBD risk. So uh, on that background of formative work, uh, we then entered a phase of um, thinking about what sort of uh, strategy could we come up to, with to improve uh, cardiovascular disease prevention care. And we used a human-centered design approach. Many of you uh, would be familiar with this, a very iterative process of engaging stakeholders in a design team to brainstorm, conceptualize, create, and then prototype, test, uh, re retool, reiterate, um, and, and assess feasibility and acceptability so that you, in the end, have a product that is really tailored to the needs of the end user. Uh, and this work is being led uh, by our uh, diversity supplement awardee, uh, uh, Dr. Angela Afa at, uh, uh, at NYU. So uh, it's a very fun process uh, for those of you who may have participated in similar activities. A lot of sticky notes um, and a lot of kind of engagement with diverse stakeholders um, to, to come up with ideas um, that really will be tailored to, to, um, to the context. Um, and uh, also relatively mentally exhausting, I'll have to say, as a participant in the, in the process, um, it, was, it was a lot of work. Uh, but in the end, we, we came up with a four component um, implementation strategy, which consists of uh, nurse-led care coordination really importantly to, to bridge those gaps, miscommunications between ID docs and, and primary care docs, um, to um, kind of overcome clinical inertia. Uh, we have nurse managed uh, medication protocols in which nurses are very familiar with evidence-based therapies for, you know, for blood pressure and may suggest to providers, they're not prescribing them, but may suggest um, uh, opportunities to improve the evidence-based uh, approach to their blood pressure monitoring. Um, adherence support for things like statin myalgias um, and that sort of thing. And then thirdly, home blood pressure monitoring uh, fits very uh, strong, uh, importantly into the, into the uh, strategy. And there are some um, electronic medical re report or medical record support tools as well. So we are testing this strategy in a, a randomized controlled trial of 300 people living with HIV on ART with suppressed viral load, uh, who also then have a diagnosis of hypertension and hyperlipidemia. So they have to have both conditions. They are randomized one-to-one -one and stratified by clinic site uh, to this intervention versus uh, a control um, interventions, just generic uh, prevention education delivered at each of these four time points that you see here, a baseline four, eight, and 12 months. And the primary outcome of this trial is change in systolic blood pressure, uh, over, over the, the trial period, and secondarily, uh, change in non-HDL cholesterol. Uh, but we are not only interested in efficacy from a, a clinical outcomes uh, standpoint. Uh, this is a, an implementation trial. Um, it's a hybrid type one trial in which the, the efficacy uh, measures are, are, are primary, uh, but there are some implement, implementation measures that we are also very interested in. So some of those are shown here using uh, a re-aim framework. We're interested in, for example, uh, from uh, a reach perspective, what is the percentage of eligible participants who agree to participate um, in terms of adoption? How, how many blood pressure measurements are people uh, actually taking? Are they, are they 
using the components of, of the strategy, um, and then a qualitative assessments of, of other measures as well. So uh, one of those uh, relates to this concept of, of, of a care team consisting of HIV providers and non-HIV providers, non-HIV specialists, primary care docs. And so we are measuring uh, the patient's ego, ego network in terms of trust and communication ties. So they take a survey um, and we look at um, their trust and communication with these docs and, and nurses. And the question is when we insert the prevention nurse into their ego uh, centric uh, um, network, uh, what will that do to the balance of the ties? Will that hopefully improve uh, some of the trust and communication with some of the other providers as well? So um, very interesting. We are doing well. Uh, so as you can see here, we um, have been able to stay on track in this revised version of our en enrollment goals um, to finish by the end of the year. Um, this was modified slightly in response to COVID. And so you can see that um, during, during the early COVID period, we were, were shut down for a few months, but then were able to pick up enrollment um, in, in the summer of last year. Uh, and we have a very interesting study because we were enrolling some patients pre-COVID. We have some that were you know, doing the trial during, during early COVID and we remained in touch virtually with them during, during this time period. And then patients who have enrolled later. Uh, and so we were able to, to propose to NHLBI uh, a supplement to assess and adapt to the impact of COVID-19 on CBD self-management and prevention care in adults living with HIV, the title AIM High. So this is a supplement to the extra CVD study. And so we conducted some additional uh, interviews and assessed intrapersonal, interpersonal, and community-based, uh, uh, community-level uh, impacts of COVID-19 uh, on our patients in the trial. And uh, after that impact assessment, went through another phase of our human-centered design process, this time online uh, by Zoom. Uh, and, and, and we're able to iterate a new version that was entirely virtual of the extra CBD intervention. And we are enrolling patients in this virtual version uh, of, of a clinical, in, in a clinical trial of 75 patients, looking primarily at the implementation outcomes, also looking at um, home blood pressures as, as, a, as an efficacy outcome as well. So stay tuned. Uh, unfortunately, we, we don't have any results yet, but we'll uh, hope to have results um, in a couple of years. So look forward to coming back to, to talk more about that. So let's move on to talk about Uganda. Um, what is different in the Sub-Saharan African context? Okay. So you've seen a lot of cascades by now. Um, this is the blood pressure treatment cascade in Uganda as shown uh, by my colleagues, uh, Martin Mudu, um, Jeremy Schwartz at Yale and, and others uh, published in Jades in uh, 2019. And they looked at three PEPFAR-funded clinics in Eastern Uganda. Uh, for those of you who don't know PEPFAR, PEPFAR uh, has really revolutionized um, access to antiretroviral uh, therapy in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. It stands for President's Emergency Plan to Fund AIDS Relief, um, uh, originally launched by George Bush in, in the early 2000s. Um, and so these PEPFAR-funded clinics um, do a pretty good job of uh, treating people living with HIV. So if you look here in the blue, um, the challenge always in HIV care is, is retaining people in care, but generally um, after retained in care, people do uh, quite well at, at achieving control. Um, but for hypertension, it was a little bit worse. Now, obviously retaining people in hypertension care was, was a challenge, um, but losing more patients uh, to monitor and control. And so, um, they looked at this a little bit more closely. So like I said, there were three clinics and they looked at the high performing site and intermediate performing site and low performing sites, seeing that there's considerable heterogeneity. One of the sites did really, really well at treating blood pressure. And so what were the differences between these sites? Um, they looked at this in a um, mixed methods approach in which um, they used a, a, a CIFR framework, solid aid framework for implementation research. Um, and those uh, domains of the CIFR are shown here. Um, and they found in particular, there were six um, 
uh, domains that really differentiated those high performing sites from the low performing sites. Um, and I'll, I'll show those here, organizational incentives and rewards, um, available resources, uh, which is incredibly important, access to, to drugs and access to blood pressure uh, diagnostics is, is really uh, important. Um, access to knowledge and information, knowledge and beliefs about the intervention, self-efficacy and planning were, were other uh, domains. And so uh, when we think about how do we intervene on this um, to improve um, uh, performance in terms of increasing blood pressure control, um, we need to think about these particular domains. And they actually uh, created a, a, a small intervention um, aimed primarily at um, diagnosis and, and screening with, with blood pressure equipment that was made available. Um, and then uh, access to evidence-based uh, medicines, uh, primarily um, calcium channel blocker as an uh, initial suggested first line, um, and then angiotensin receptor blocker and diuretic. And uh, they found that at baseline, the hypertension care uh, cascade shown here in red uh, was extremely poor, okay, with 5% with actually achieving control. Um, but after six months, they were able to screen 100% of the patients coming in, um, diagnosing 100% of those who had hypertension. And of those with hypertension, 66% uh, were started on treatment. So um, of those 66% started on treatment, there were very high numbers that were retained and relatively high numbers that achieved control uh, after six months. So these pilot data were used then uh, to um, uh, to help us formulate an idea for a UG3, UH3 phased clinical trial uh, for which I am co-PI together with Fred Semitala at, um, at uh, this clinic, MJAP, the uh, Macquarie Joint AIDS Program, and IDRC, the Infectious Disease Research Collaboration. Mm -hmm. And the title of our uh, proposal was Strengthening this Blood Pressure Care and Treatment Cascade for Ugandans living with HIV, implementation strategies to save lives. This uh, Palesa project is also part of a consortium in NHLBI of other projects in Africa, one of which is in Mozambique, uh, Sarah Gimbel at the School of Nursing, uh, co-PI together with Anna Mukumbi uh, from, uh, from Mozambique. So we'll talk about uh, Palesa. Um, our, our first aim was uh, as an extra CVD to perform a, a formative assessment of current practice routines, barriers and facilitators of evidence-based blood pressure care in Kampala and Wakisu. I mentioned earlier those, those clinics um, that I talked about earlier were in Eastern Uganda. We wanted to really focus on the urban and the peri-urban situation in Uganda. Then in, in a similar human-centered design uh, phase, uh, we proposed to develop a multi-component implementation strategy, which will be called Hypertension Plus, uh, to uh, improve uptake and adherence uh, of these treatments, okay? Now this uh, Hypertension Plus strategy will be compared to what I'll call a Hypertension Basic strategy, and we will look at the effectiveness of these implementation strategies uh, to improve blood pressure uh, cascade metrics with a primary outcome of uh, uh, blood pressure control that is defined less than 140 over 90. <clears throat> and thirdly, to evaluate the economic and financial sustainability of these integrated care strategies through cost effectiveness analyses um, led by uh, Rachel Nugent uh, from RTI International, also affiliated uh, here with the University of Washington. So this is our team, uh, collaborators. We're working in this area around Kampala for those of you who are less familiar with the geography. Um, and Wakiso District, uh, which is just the surrounding district uh, around Kampala. And our formative assessment really is, is geared towards assessing principles of hypertension care, right? Is there availability of blood pressure measurement equipment in the clinic? Um, are people, uh, is there enough adequate human resources? Um, are there consistent supply of meds um, and, and blood pressure treatment algorithms? Um, and is there any sort of monitoring for uh, blood pressure response, side effects, um, and organ damage, that sort of thing. But we're also interested in engaging with these clinics about HIV care innovations, because there really have been a number of remarkable care innovations uh, honed in Africa, um, and now perhaps relevant to the US context. 
thinks that we, we lump into this category of differentiated service delivery, which is a, generally a concept of providing more intensive care to those who really need it, and, and perhaps less intensive care to those who are, are quite stable. Um, and so uh, how can we apply this to the hypertension care uh, provided to these uh, patients in clinic? Uh, like I said, we'll be using a CIFR framework and uh, human-centered design approach to this um, uh, AIM-1 development. We're kind of in the midst of that right now, uh, so I don't have any data to report, uh, but look forward to doing that uh, in the near future. So um, this hypertension basic strategy will essentially be uh, providing these clinics with free and consistent access to blood pressure diagnostic equipment, evidence-based antihypertensive drugs, and, and BP management in kind of a very, very low touch uh, way, you know, access online, that sort of thing. Whereas Hypertension Plus will be this um, uh, strategy designed with uh, input from stakeholders and thinking about how do we uh, even make it better? How do we improve upon just having access to drugs and, and equipment? Um, this may include things like uh, additional training enhancements, the DSD models that I talked about, uh, and other forms of, of more technical assistance for complex patients. And the details of this strategy, uh, as I mentioned, will be uh, determined in, in the stakeholder informed uh, design phase. So this is our stepped wedge clinical trial design. It's a cluster randomized controlled trial in a stepped wedge design where we're going to roll out two sites at a time, 16 sites total, two at a time randomized to either the basic strategy or the hypertension plus strategy. Um, and they will be uh, followed over time. Eventually, all of the clinics will be exposed to, to one strategy, and this will be compared to the control periods um, you know, using standard uh, statistical approaches that many of you probably are familiar with. Now, our statistician, Dr. Donna Z uh, Spiegelman from, from Yale, um, is an implementation scientist and has uh, pioneered this concept of adaptive design that she calls uh, LAGO, or learn as you go. And we will have two opportunities to improve this hypertension plus strategy during the trial to look at individual components of the strategy and to assess their effect in interim analyses and decide if something's not having much of an effect, we maybe drop that component and augment other components that seem to be having uh, more effect. So um, an interesting and complex uh, study design. Uh, but we're, as I mentioned, very interested in, in costs and cost effectiveness. Um, some of the types of costs that we'd be interested as outlined by David Watkins uh, here at UW and, and Rachel in their, in their 2018 publication. Um, these are the minimum components of an economic data set for cost effectiveness analysis of HIV and CV integration. And um, of these, our, our primary um, outcome really in interest is, is the cost effectiveness or incremental cost per BP controlled patient. But we're also interested in other aspects, um, including household out-of-pocket costs, recognizing that many of our uh, patients in, in Uganda are, are paying for transportation. They're maybe losing uh, income because they had to take a day off of work to come to clinic. Um, and this gets at, at an equity issue, right, uh, which can really be impactful for those um, at the lower end of the income spectrum. And then we're also interested in, in total incremental cost of care, which, uh, you know, if it's cost effective, but it's just massively expensive, um, it, it may still be difficult to get this implemented and other uh, measures of, that may be relevant to scalability, such as the difference between integrated versus standard care. So um, with that, I'll uh, conclude by just making a few more remarks about reciprocal innovation. Uh, and this concept comes from the idea of reverse innovation, um, as described in, uh, in this uh, publication and many others, uh, which is the concept that there, there often are innovations developed in low-income countries that make their way into high-income countries and, and can be innovated further and adopted uh, in high-income countries. But the idea that um, innovation only happens in that direction is, is, is uh, uh, too simple. And there's a new concept that's a uh, new vocabulary that's, that's being uh, um, advocated for, which is reciprocal innovation, that, that this is really a, um, it's, it's really a, a cycle uh, that um, innovations that are um, developed in low-income countries may, may be used in high-income countries. Those may be innovated. It may come back to low-income countries. And, and this uh, cycle of innovation uh, is something we're very, very interested 
uh, in. Uh, some examples, you know, low cost ECG machines that were developed in India and then have now made it into the US market uh, in, certain, in certain situations. Um, Ushahidi is a, um, is a mapping service that uses uh, crowdsourced cell phone data uh, to map disasters, was used in, in Haiti and Kenya before being used in the southern United States in Louisiana and in flood, flooding disaster areas. Um, Partners in Health, many of you are familiar with, with Paul Farmer and others, their work uh, in Haiti and delivering and, and really um, kind of honing this uh, uh, close, to kind, close to client uh, care structure where uh, in rural Haiti, they can provide really, really high quality services. And that is now being uh, used in Boston uh, to inform some of their work, uh, work there. And so Raj has summarized some of the potential lessons to bring back from, from his work uh, and, and, and our work in, in East Africa, um, summarized here uh, in, in this slide. I, I'll just point out, uh, I think we've talked about task redistribution, task sharing, um, as, as some people like to say, uh, but having uh, other people other than physicians uh, to do, do the work that, um, that we're talking about, hypertension control in particular. Um, there are clearly lots of mHealth interventions that have been developed in, in Sub-Saharan Africa that have relevance to, to the U.S., um, but thinking about linkage to retention and care and decentralization of clinical services is also really relevant to the U.S. context. So for people that may be interested in this concept of reciprocal innovation, um, Indiana University, um, who runs the MPATH program and, and others are, are running this um, uh, seminar, in October, I'm happy to share details if you contact me um, after the talk. So in conclusion, I'll uh, just end uh, by saying that strategies to improve cardiovascular outcomes for people living with HIV should seek to number one, thoroughly understand the context of CBD prevention care uh, in wherever this work is being done. And I think uh, hopefully I've uh, convinced you today that we're doing that in, in, in Cleveland and Durham and uh, in Uganda. Uh, but secondly, to engage then, engage the stakeholders, and most importantly, people living with HIV in, in developing innovative ways to, to uh, improve uptake of proven effective therapies. And then thirdly, uh, to take advantage of these massive investments uh, from PEPFAR and others um, in, in HIV AIDS care in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and to think about how we might reciprocally innovate solutions uh, from Africa um, to uh, the high income country context and, and continue that cycle of reciprocal innovation. And so um, with that, I will uh, thank many of uh, my collaborators um, and apologies if I'm missing anyone, but uh, really enjoy uh, working with, with all of these uh, people and um, certainly the, the funding uh, as well from NHLBI and study participants in Cleveland, uh, Durham and Uganda. And uh, really looking forward uh, to joining the team here uh, and becoming a Husky in a little over a month. So um, happy to take, take questions. I think we have about 12 minutes or so. Fantastic. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Uh, we really look forward to your leadership of our global cardiovascular program and in particular your mentorship of uh, our young, young trainees who are interested in global health. Um, with that, I open to questions. Um, if you could raise your hand so we can call on you. And while we're waiting for people to come forward with questions, Chris, wh why don't you tell us your, you know, broad question, your vision for global health here at UW? I know you've had some time to think about this now. Yeah, so you know, I've shared a little bit of this with um, with you last summer, and um, again, just recently at the um, cardiology faculty meeting. Um, but essentially, I believe we need to to focus um, on uh, both uh, not only the traditional CVDs. A lot of those I talked about today, you know, ischemic heart disease, um, atrial fibrillation, heart heart failure, but also the endemic cardiovascular diseases that we see in many parts of the world, such as uh, rheumatic heart disease, endomyocardial fibrosis. I think there's a real opportunity to catalyze translational research uh, in, in those spaces as well. Um, and when, and 
when I think about translational research, I really think that, that our program will be focused because of the strengths of, of the University of Washington in these areas on later stage translation. So things like implementation science and population health, uh, right? And so I think that will be, be the focus, um, but uh, not to say that if, if there's a basic science person that's interested in mechanisms of malaria or, or the mechanisms of uh, inflammation and cardiovascular disease in East Africa, that those people would not be included. But I think uh, we're very interested in implementation science. Um, and ultimately, uh, the vision is to improve um, cardiovascular disease outcomes, but also to promote cardiovascular health, not just focused on disease, but, but health and talking about physical activity um, and, uh, and diet and that sort of thing. So I think, um, you know, I, I look forward to uh, spending some time getting to know uh, who all is working in this space um, at UW. And then I think we'll make our priorities um, based on that. Um, this, these will include things like um, pilot grants for um, collaborative awards. Another theme that will be important is interdisciplinary. We want um, nurses and we want um, economists, uh, public health people working together with uh, physicians um, and others to solve these, these problems. Um, so uh, pilot grants, um, perhaps a, a, a track within the, the fellowship program um, for, for those who are interested uh, in global health. Um, and there are many, uh, you know, potential uh, other op opportunities as well. Um, certainly faculty recruitment uh, is, is a priority. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Um, yeah, but no, look forward to refining that further. Yeah, that was, that was perfect. And, and as you know, and as you'll discover, there's a lot of people working in the space outside even of uh, both uh, cardiology and global health. So there's a really... Absolutely strong, interesting community here for you to tap into and, and to make into a much bigger program. Um, I don't see any raised hands. Happy to, uh, to talk a little bit about um, my clinic, if that's of interest. Um, we, would, we would love to hear what you, you plan to do at the Madison Clinic. Yeah, yeah. So, so in Cleveland, um, I've been doing this since 2013. So I, I graduated fellowship in 2012 and in tw 2013 um, started this HIV cardiology clinic that's embedded within the special immunology unit, uh, the name of our HIV clinic in Cleveland. Um, see patients twice, twice a month. Um, about half of the patients I see have a, have a known diagnosis. So they have heart failure, coronary disease, AFib, and I'm, I'm their cardiologist, I'm their general cardiologist. But about half of the patients are, are, are prevention, so difficult to control hypertension or um, advanced lipid issues, um, diabetes. Um, sometimes just people, you know, they want to know a little bit more about cardiovascular risk and HIV, um, and they want to, you know, start exercising or something like that. And so I, I see them for prevention. So uh, I would call myself a preventive cardiologist, and I look forward to uh, bringing that sort of model uh, to, to Harborview and Madison. And um, while recognizing it, there may be some, some, some unique differences and unique opportunities. Um, Heidi Crane, who is an infectious disease doc at, at Madison, um, is very interested in, in metabolic disease and has kind of uh, developed a, a bit of a, a metabolic clinic. Um, so working with her to think about our, our, our patients who have not only HIV infection, but comorbid diabetes, how do we really help to optimize their cardiovascular risk reduction? Um, you know, I think uh, there are, are many opportunities, but um, we'll, we'll look forward to working with the HIV providers there. I'm not sure if any of them are on the call uh, to, to, to develop a, a, a nice program there. Yeah, that'll be a really nice uh, addition to uh, our, our Harborview programs. That's fantastic. We have a question from Chris Patton. Chris, do you want to ask your question live? Can we unmute Chris Patton? Yes, just unmuted her. Uh, she's still muted. He invited her to speak. Hold on one second. I can read her question if if we're unable to unmute her. 
why don't I go ahead and read Chris's question? Um, Chris just said she doesn't have a good signal. So uh, uh, Chris, you talked about the immense trust that patients with HIV have in their clinicians. Um, obviously that's a pr pretty specialized situation. Uh, are there things we can do in cardiology clinic to foster that same trust in our patients? I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, and I think that in, in HIV, part of the reason uh, patients trust their HIV clinicians is not just because of their relationship with that one specific person, but because HIV clinics have evolved with this really intense kind of um, esprit de corps, you know, uh, culture within the clinic of taking care of patients as a team, right? And so I think that um, if, if we in cardiology could do that for all of our patients um, to develop um, peer support, to develop other sorts of uh, wraparound services to allow our patients to really feel like they belong to our clinic, um, that's going to improve their trust in the system, right? And so um, there, there, are, there are clearly um, individual level factors that are at play, but I think there are ways that you can structure a clinic to really um, kind of promote that trust. Uh, so that's, that's what I would say, you know, having, um, having nurses play very prominent roles in um, in helping to, to manage uh, care, I think is also uh, really, really valuable and ultimately improving um, the trust in the system. And for HIV, it's, there's a lot related to stigma that's kind of unique to wanting that very specialized um, kind of home, um, maybe less important in general cardiology, but I think some of those other things I mentioned are important. Fantastic. On that note, uh, thanks again, uh, Chris. Looking forward to seeing you uh, in a month's time. Thank you so much, Nana. It's really been a pleasure to uh, talk with you today and look forward to it.